Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing antithrombin-3 and heparin. Okay, so let's just complete our discussion of thromboemboli. Okay, so a thromboembolus is an embolus, which just means a particle that is moving around the bloodstream that is made up of a portion of a thrombus. Okay, now this means that these large particles can be... Um, can be moved to other sites within the body, okay? So you might have a thrombus forming maybe in an artery within the leg or somewhere like that, and it could end up being moved up to somewhere completely different, basically. Uh, so, um, this means that these thromboemboli can end up lodged in smaller blood vessels in the heart and the brain. So you might not even need a thrombus to form in the blood vessel of the heart or of the brain. It could form somewhere very, very distant away, and then uh, it could be moved through the bloodstream up to a blood vessel in the heart and the brain where it would completely lodge, uh, where it would get lodged in that blood vessel and completely block that blood vessel. Okay, so emboli can also be very dangerous. So from by, not only can they be dangerous where they form, but they can also cast off emboli, uh, which can then um, affect blood vessels far away from the initial blood vessel that produced the thrombus. And this is one of the reasons that atherosclerosis is so dangerous, because it can uh, act as a um, scaffold for the formation of thrombosis, thromboses. Okay, right. So... Now let's talk about antithrombin-3, because antithrombin-3 is basically an endogenous mechanism that the body has for trying to stop the formation of thrombi on the surface of endothelial cells. Okay, so let's discuss antithrombin-3 then. So firstly, let me just say that there were originally four antithrombins discovered. So there was antithrombin-1, antithrombin-2, antithrombin-3, and antithrombin-4. However, the only one of these that is not trivial is antithrombin-3. So often, you will hear people refer to antithrombin-3 just merely as antithrombin. So if someone is talking about antithrombin, then they most likely are talking about antithrombin-3. If they don't clarify, if they don't specifically say antithrombin with a number, if they just say antithrombin, then you can assume that they are talking about antithrombin-3, because antithrombin-1, 2, and 4 are just not important, we don't think, uh, as far as physiology is actually concerned. Okay, so antithrombin-3 is a protein which is produced by the liver and is capable when activated of inhibiting a huge number of uh, the coagulation factors. Okay, right, so it's what is known as a serpin, okay, and this stands for a serine protease inhibitor, and this is because most of these enzymes uh, that are involved in the coagulation cascade are serine proteases, uh, so a serpin is a protein which is going to inhibit serine proteases. So this is a serine protease inhibitor. Okay, so they took the SER from serine, they took the P from protease, and they took the IN from inhibitor and got serpin. So antithrombin-3 is an example of a serpin. Right, so which of the coagulation factors specifically is it going to inhibit? Well, the main one it inhibits, the one after which it is named, is that it inhibits thrombin. So it inhibits the enzyme thrombin, or factor 2A. Okay, now remember thrombin is responsible for the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. So it's responsible for the conversion of factor 1 into factor 1A. So it's the enzyme that actually is responsible for the coagulation process, really. So by inhibiting it, you're going to stop the conversion of the inactive fibrinogen within the blood into fibrin, okay? Uh, so that's the main target of antithrombin-3, and that's why it's called antithrombin, basically. But it also inhibits a whole bunch of other uh, coagulation proteins, so we'll go through these now. So it also inhibits factor, so let me talk about the other ones it inhibits. So it inhibits factor 9A, so we'll go through them in um, consecutive order. 
it inhibits factor 10a, it inhibits factor 11a, and don't worry, I will show you the pathways again so that we can understand what the role of this is. I'm not just going to list them off. But this is why we needed to discuss the coagulation pathways in so much detail, so that we can understand why um, inhibiting these is actually important. Uh, if I hadn't, I, I would have just listed this off, and what would that have meant? It would have meant nothing, basically. So, we'll start with the extrinsic coagulation pathway. So, basically, antithrombin-3 inhibits this one. In fact, I'll circle the ones that it's going to target. It inhibits activated Hageman factor, factor 12A. So if you are unlucky enough to get some um, factor 12A in the bloodstream, which you shouldn't get, so if factor 12 is being activated to factor 12A within the bloodstream, then what will happen is that this antithrombin-3, which is also within the bloodstream, is going to inactivate that. In addition, it's also going to inactivate our factor 11A here. And I just want to make sure that in that list, I actually put the A's. Good, I did put the A's. Okay. So, it's also going to inhibit factor 11A. So, if you get any 11A being formed, it's going to inhibit that. It also inactivates factor 9A. And finally, also factor 10A. So, pretty much every step of the coagulation pathway. And then, finally, thrombin. So, it actually inactivates every single step of the intrinsic coagulation pathway and stops it from happening. So you're going to stop the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. And this is one of the um, endogenous mechanisms designed to stop the coagulation cascade from happening. Okay, and we know that if we stop coagulation from happening, then Fibrin, these fibrin strands, and I want to stress this, how important the fibrin meshwork actually is for holding together a thrombus. If you didn't have the fibrin meshwork holding the platelets together, those interactions that are directly between the platelets, they're very weak. The fibrin meshwork is what holds a thrombus together, so you need the fibrin to hold a thrombus together. So if you can't form uh, fibrin strands, then you're not going to form thrombi. Okay, so um, let's finally also look at the um, extrinsic pathway, and yeah, let's just complete this. So the only one that, well actually two of them are inhibited on this pathway, so you inhibit 10A, okay, and you also inhibit thrombin, and those two are crucial at the end here. So if you inhibit thrombin, you stop the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. If you inhibit 10A, you stop the activation of thrombin in the first place. Okay. So, we now understand how this antithrombin is going to stop coagulation, but now let's talk a little bit about how antithrombin itself is activated, because this is an interesting topic. So, basically, we'll start with the major endogenous way of activating thrombin. Well, sorry, I'm sorry, of activating antithrombin-3. Um, and it's that the antithrombin-3 is going to stick to a structure on the surface of endothelial cells. So let's have our blood vessel here. Okay. And the blood vessel has these endothelial cells lining the lumen. Okay, so here are our endothelial cells. And then this side will also have endothelial cells. So basically, the endothelial cells are going to have a um, polysaccharide on their surface. Uh, which is going to bind to the antithrombin-3. And by the way, antithrombin-3 is often denoted as AT, and then you put Roman numerals 3 like that. So remember, this is produced in the liver and dumped into the bloodstream. However, antithrombin-3 is not activated until it binds to this polysaccharide which is on the surface of endothelial cells, okay? And once it's activated, it will inhibit thrombin, it will inhibit 9A, 10A, 11A, and 12A. Okay, so what is this polysaccharide on the surface of the endothelial cells? Well, basically, it is a polysaccharide known as heparan sulfate, okay? And I want to go to some detail to explain what heparan sulfate actually is to you because people often confuse it with heparin, okay? And I want to explain what the difference between heparan sulfate and heparin. So this green stuff on the surface of the endothelial cell, 
This is supposed to represent this polysaccharide heparan sulfate. And I want to stress that this is different from heparin. Um, okay. Both of them are endogenous polysaccharides. They are both polysaccharides. Okay. And uh, they both bind and activate antithrombin 3 but they are fundamentally different. So I want to now explain to you what heparan sulfate is, and then we'll discuss what heparin is. So, heparan sulfate then, this polysaccharide which is on the surface of our endothelial cells, and which will bind to the antithrombin 3, so antithrombin 3 will come along, bind to the heparan sulfate, and it will then be activated, and it will inactivate thrombin 9A, 10A, 11A, and 12A. So, heparan sulfate then. Okay, so it's what is known as a glycosaminoglycan, okay? And I want to try and explain what a glycosaminoglycan is. So it's a glycosaminoglycan. Okay, so a glycan is basically a polysaccharide, okay? It's specifically it's a polymer of glucose, but this isn't quite as simple as this. Okay, so it's modified glucose that we're going to polymerize together here. And um, basically what you have is a repeating disaccharide. So what you're going to do is you're going to have a disaccharide, okay, and I'll just explain to you what a disaccharide is. Disaccharide. Okay, so a disaccharide is basically two sugar molecules bound together. Okay, so you'll have one sugar here, and it will be bound to another sugar here. Okay, so you have two sugar molecules bound together. Now, glycosaminoglycans are basically disaccharide after disaccharide after disaccharide. So you link loads and loads of disaccharides together. So you'll bring in another disaccharide here. Okay, and you'll link it with this first disaccharide, and then you'll link another disaccharide on to create a polysaccharide. And glycosaminoglycans are polysaccharides constructed out of certain disaccharide um, constituents. So there are um, six disaccharides that I'm going to tell you about, which you can build glycosaminoglycans out of. And heparan sulfate is a, a polysaccharide made out of these di six disaccharides, and it's got a certain fraction of um, disaccharides, basically. There's a certain disaccharide which is the main disaccharide in heparan sulfate. And the difference between heparan sulfate and heparin is going to be that they're both polymers, that are, well, they're both polysaccharides like this, they're both disaccharides linked to disaccharides linked to disaccharides, but the uh, composition, the main disaccharide in heparin is going to be different from the main disaccharide in heparan sulfate. Okay, so let's start discussing uh, what the disaccharides that are uh, used in these glycosaminoglycans are. So we're going to look at one of these disaccharides. So basically, the disaccharides which make up glycosaminoglycans basically consist of two sugars. Now, in this first slot here, you generally have a uronic acid sugar, and I will explain to you what a uronic acid sugar is in a moment. Okay? And in this um, position here, you generally have an amino sugar, and again, you'll see what an amino sugar is in a moment. Okay, right. So, and also we have to remember that this is heparan sulfate. So we're also often going to have these sugars that are in these two positions. Uh, they'll have sulfate groups added on to them, and I'll discuss with you what a sulfate group is as well. Okay, right. So let's start off by looking at examples of uronic acid sugars. Okay, so a uronic acid sugar is basically where... In fact, maybe actually we should probably start by looking at the structure of glucose and then build up to the structure of a uronic acid sugar. So we'll start with the structure of glucose then. Um, okay, so the structure of glucose. So glucose is a six-membered ring where you have an oxygen here. 
okay? And then the other five members of the ring are carbons, okay? And then what you're going to have is off this fifth carbon coming out of the page towards us, and this is important, you will see just how important the optical isomerism of this is later, okay? So here coming out of the board at us is going to be the sixth carbon of the glucose. So you have a sixth carbon, and we're drawing a skeletal structure so we don't show the carbon, and then it will have an alcohol group coming off it. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.